obviously there's lots to cover. So let's start at the very beginning. I was born in Huntington Beach and grew up in Manhattan Beach, California. Amazing. And then my mom was an asthmatic. So when I was nine, we moved to Palm Springs. So then uh, how did oh, the... So then how did I get into doing hair? Yeah, I mean, because I, 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 from what I've heard, it was a super, it wasn't like a sort of a teenage Okay, so this, is, this is something funny. So in junior high school, there was a girl named Sharon Hawkins. And she was super cute. She had Farrah Fawcett hair. Right. She was wearing a tube top and bell bottoms. And um, Christmas vacation came. We get out for Christmas vacation for two weeks. And Sharon Hawkins had a bob that was permed. She was wearing skinny, tight, little skinny leather jean pants, stretchy skinnies. And she was still just as hot. Oh, interesting. So I was like, huh? Wow, she got a bob with a perm. Right. Like the hair changed, but she was still just as hot. She was like, it was a new look. So I saw it change. And I remember seeing that and being like, oh, fascinated. Yeah. Cut to, we were best friends. And in 10th grade, they offered beauty school as an elective. So instead of taking like art and, 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 you know, the uh, motor shop. Yeah. I would go to beauty school for after school. Cut to, I become a hairdresser, right. 18, move out. Um, I graduate high school by the skin of my teeth. And I got a job at the hair salon that my mom, when she was pregnant with me, went to. Interesting. Yeah. And you know, at this time, the first guest jeans just started, hair went from rocker to new wave. We're talking early 80s. Right. There was a big change in style. There was punk rock, there was new wave, there was uh, GQ magazine. Basically, all of a sudden, I'm taking people's hair and I'm cutting them short on the sides and back and long on top like a, like a L'Oreal moose ad or like the <laughs> guest jeans girl. And there was this guy named Paul Palazzato. He would always have me cut his hair. He's like, you do my hair the best. He goes, there's this guy, this photographer, he wants to shoot me. And he goes, will you come? He doesn't have a hairdresser. He just, I'm will right. you come down to the beach? And I said, oh, absolutely. So I go down and I, you know, do his hair and it's Bruce Weber. And Bruce was like, oh, I really like the way you did the hair. And he goes, can you do makeup? Like makeup on women? Can you do women? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So I like go, go to, I think I go to like Rite Aid and buy some makeup. And he's like, but just you were do. already trained. I mean, well, not to do Yeah, but I wasn't doing women's makeup. <laughs> right, right, right. But I have an opinion on everything. Of course. And so um, I did. And he said to me, he said, you should really, you should go to Milan. Next thing you know, like I did it for for four months. Wow. So just to just to recap, so you went because uh, you started off with the guy on the Bruce Webber shoot, but you went to Milan doing women and men. Yeah, mostly women. Wow. Just I started testing with all these assistants that were needing hair and makeup artists for when they were off on the weekends. So that's where I got my pictures. Right. And I'll never forget, I was working with this one assistant. He said, I want greasy hair and take that grease that you're putting and I want to make her face really greasy. And the next thing you know, we're, we're taking these Dolce Gabbana ads and we go right there to grunge. Wow. I come back with a whole new book, a whole new look. Amazing. Yeah, cut to Greg Gorman, a photographer here in LA, needed a hairdresser makeup artist. The one that was booked for the job was drugged up and hung over. So they, they <laughs> emergency, they're like, there's this kid, Chris McMillan, he'll do the hair and the makeup. He says, I'm doing a magazine called Flaunt. Oh yeah. And he said, it's, um, it's Christian Slater. Next thing you know, it's the cover and eight pages. And I'm like, in my book it goes, in my book, every picture, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I buy 10 of them and I've got this, amazing book and then i met this woman named molly madden and the next thing you know she offered me a job to go on the world tour with the movie true romance and you'll do patricia arquette's hair and makeup and christian slater's hair and makeup amazing how old are you at this point 25 26 wow so me and patricia are in paris and she needs her roots done and i'm stoned 
And I go to the pharmacy and I look for a box that has blonde on it. And I was like, I think I don't read French, but let's just try this. <laughs> and I put it on her hair and I cut her hair into a, I'm like, we're in France. Let's cut your hair into a little French girl bob. <laughs> I'm like, let's do it. She's like, okay, you know? And so we do it. Like I give her this little bleached French girl bob. The next thing you know, we're doing press and she's on the cover of La La Monde yeah. as like, you know, American darling in Paris doing a French haircut. It must be very uh, satisfying and exciting to sort of be a creative where you have an idea and you're able to just do it immediately. For, well, that's the, that's what I was when we were talking earlier. It's like I've always had a point of view. Yeah. I've always had an idea. I go to the grocery store and I was like, my checkout girl, I'm like. If you just cut the bottom pieces <laughs> off and maybe parted it on the side. So, so then, Drisha, okay, so you've done that now. So, so then, come back to LA, life is, I'm working at a stilo, I'm getting stoned, I'm kind of doing drugs a little bit, you know, but I'm managing, I'm a real managing creative. That's what we do, right? Creative yeah. people. Molly Madden, Patricia's manager, says, I have this girl, she's doing a pilot on a TV show and they're, they're not really sure about her hair, but they're not sure if she's going to get the show. So hence I meet this girl, Jennifer Aniston, and she comes walking into a stilo and she's got like curly hair and bangs. And I was like, oh no, 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 no. You need to like grow your bangs out. You have a little forehead. Like girls with little foreheads shouldn't have bangs. It's just, you shouldn't, you need to grow that out. So I cut her hair here and then layered it all to the bangs. And then I blew it out with a round brush. And then I said, just pin them over until they can grow out. So like clockwork, three weeks later, she's back in, a little trim. Right. Three weeks later, back in, a little trim. All of a sudden, like, she's like, Every, the show's kind of like becoming popular. Next thing you know, like the Rachel yeah. hit. But I'm also really kind of checked out. I'm really doing hair but I'm also really stoned every night. Was it actually a thing? I mean, obviously people were talking about hair, but is it, was it as big as we look back and see it as? I always felt really uncomfortable using that to promote me. I wonder what that is. Personally. Is it, is like, it because, of the, because you felt that that success was, was uh, not in, in, in relation to I didn't to deserve your... that, res right. that success because I was a stoner and I was using drugs. And by the way, Barry Smithers was this hot model walking the streets of New York that Ward was cutting her hair. And that's all I did. I loved her haircut so much that Ward did. So I just copied a haircut that one of my favorite hairdressers, Ward, did. Right. So I didn't deserve it. It actually, Ward deserves credit for the Rachel. That was going to be one of my questions. Where do you find your inspiration? Because a lot of people would say that it's either models or it is uh, movies. Yeah. I'm really inspired by models and fashion. Right. So then, so just to finish off on the career uh, journey, the Rachel thing had happened. Yeah. You were obviously getting more clients because of that. Yeah. I remember doing a photo shoot somewhere around this neighborhood and it's the end of season one, the beginning of season two. We're done with the shoot and we leave and there's a hundred paparazzi gangbustering Jen and everybody on friends. And I was like, that was weird. Right. Like, wow. Next thing you know, like Jen's life changed right. and her life became so big that she felt comfortable surrounding herself with people like me to do her hair. I always was, had a idea and an energy and a point of view and she loved it. Because there's a fine balance, there's a fine line between when you're a creative and you're, you're a photographer or a hairstylist, having a creative idea but um, not going so far with it that you forget who the person is. Translating it. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. always have to sort of try and find a happy medium between what that person wants, what that person needs and how they look good. And there's that fine line of keeping the client happy, but also getting a cool picture and pushing them enough to like getting Jen to do wet hair. Right. You know what I mean? She was like, oh my God, I love my hair. It was amazing. This is the best blow dry and I can't believe you're getting my hair wet. Yeah. And then it ends up being later, she's like, I love that picture. It's my favorite picture. You've been very vocal about your addiction. Yeah. And how, but I want to talk about that, but also how the, the repercussions of that 
in a positive way. The, obviously, we talked about it already that you were getting stoned a lot. And, and then I went from, from snorting coke to smoking coke, which smoking coke to buying crack on the street. So I ended up ultimately becoming addicted to crack. And this is at the height of your... At, at Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston. Like, like, I'm in this height. I'm 127 pounds. You know, I think I look good. <laughs> it's a Thursday, um, October 14th, 1999. Um, I go to the car wash. 99 cents for a 40 ounce of malt liquor. And then the rest is going to go to the craft dealer. Yeah. Wow. And I can't wait to get home. So I take a hit of crack at the stop sign at the top of the street. And then I notice there's an undercover cop car behind me. Oh mm -hmm. my God. All right. And that's when I realized if being in jail is going to keep me sober, then I'm happy with being in jail than having to have to use drugs anymore. Right. Because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired at that moment and at court. And they released me to a men's sober living Liberty house um, upon completion, meaning they got to decide how long. Right. And I was there for 16 months, Whew. 16 months. So I didn't work for a year. And in the rooms was this woman named Carrie White. And she's this fabulous woman, like, ah, oh, I'm a star. Like, she's fabulous. In the 60s, she was a huge hairdresser in Beverly Hills. Right. She used to ride on roller skates. I would hear her speak at meetings. And she was like, I was so high. I would do hair on roller skates. And then I'd shoot heroin in the bathroom in between clients. And I was like, oh, my God. And so they said, at the Men's Sober Living, they said, you have to go work at Supercuts. And I said, fine, as, as long as I can do hair. See. Then Carrie White said, why don't you come work with me? So I presented that to uh, Liberty House and they said, because you were willing to go work at Supercuts, we'll let you work with Carrie White. I was working at the salon called Tova in Beverly Hills and I get a phone call and it's Jennifer Aniston. They're like, Jennifer Aniston's on the phone. And she's like, hi, look out the window. So go to the front door. And I look out the window. I'm like, okay. She goes, I'm over here. <laughs> and a uh, little hands, like she's hiding from the paparazzi. And she, I like run over there and she goes. <laughs> I'm like, ah. <laughs> she goes, you always promised you'd do my hair when I got married. And I'm asking you, will you do my hair? I'm getting married to Brad Pitt. And I was like, well, I have to ask permission from Liberty House. Right. And I was like, for sure, they're going to say no. So I asked Larry, who ran the house, and he said, if you get me a signed autograph picture from Fight Club of Brad Pitt, and cool. you take your, uh, your sponsor with you to the wedding, yes, you can do it. And uh, yeah, I did the wedding. And when I got back from the wedding, I had to clean every single bathroom in the in the house because they had to remind me, you're not a Hollywood hairdresser doing Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston's. You're a fucking drug addict yeah. and you belong in the bathrooms hand scrubbing the floors. Like, don't forget, you know, you're a drug addict. You're yeah. not a, that guy. You're first this guy. And anytime I was in the house, they'd say, hey, Chris. And it's like, hi, my name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety comes first, haircutting comes second. And they had to teach me that I'm more than a hairdresser, that I'm a brother, I'm a friend, and I'm a son. This is when I start crying. And um, that I could manipulate people with my talent to like me. I right. used hair yeah, as a course. manipulation. Yeah. And when you went back to work, was there was there um, some insecurity? Because I know that when you know you're being creative and it's hand in hand to the drugs Absolutely. and the expression and the everything. I'm and so much sudden, more take it out. creative. Hi. Right. That's definitely what I thought. Which I is, still kind of do. Yeah. You know, and also the older I get, the more I question all of that creativity that that comes with all of it. You know, there's moments of insecurity that still pop up, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm very confident in the world of, of haircutting, mm -hmm. you know? But definitely there's moments of um, 
yeah, constantly. I mean, I'm the I'm my hardest critic. Right. I'm really hard on myself. Right. You Which know. is good. Yeah. That's where you are. Who you are. So, what's your? Do you have a goal? Like, do you have a sort of? I mean, I, most people, most hairdressers, hairstylists, they would think well, they're going to do a product, or they're going to do a line of something, or I don't. No. I don't have an exit strategy. I don't plan on leaving the business. No, that's great. Like, I'm really happy. I have an amazing, amazing life surrounded about hair. And I'm working on a television show. And um, I'm collaborating on a product with a company called Drunk Elephant. Uh-huh. I own a hair salon in Beverly Hills that I've had for 20 years. And I own the business outright. Wow. One of my things that I'm really into now is this AIDS life cycle ride. Right. And uh, that's a 545-mile bike ride from San Francisco to L.A. Yes. With 2,500 people. And it's amazing. Yeah. Seeing special needs handicapped guy named Christoph who um, who can barely walk. And um, it's amazing. He can barely walk and um, he can barely talk, but this kid can ride a bike. And he's every day would come in before me. And I had no idea on a bike that had a rusted chain Wow. that I could hear a mile in front of me and a mile behind me. And uh, we bought him a bike. We donated and bought him a bike. Amazing. Because I don't want to hear that rusty chain <laughs> this year. I do not want to hear it. <laughs> like, you know, and it's, it's amazing. I think you're pretty amazing too. No, I think you're amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't just copy what I said. I, maybe I don't know how to take a compliment. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs>